Welcome to Conversations, Season 2 of the MTA Podcast Series, a weekly audio cast featuring interviews with leading investment strategists, geopolitical experts, and other key thought leaders. Brought to you by the Market Technicians Association and your host, Ed Carlson. According to our mechanical timing models, as well as my conclusions through visual analysis, we are in a bull market, a cyclical bull market, which refers to the bull bear cycle that occurs about every four years. We are currently in another cyclical bull market, seemingly headed back to the top of the trading range. Where we go from here is a matter of speculation. My best guess, and it is just a guess, is that the market will continue sideways for several more years. The pattern has been set. Tuesday, November 23rd, 2010, this is Conversations, the official MTA podcast series. And today's guest from DecisionPoint.com is Carl Swindlin. Carl Swindlin is a self-taught technical analyst who has been involved in market analysis since 1981. A pioneer in the creation of online technical resources, he is president and founder of DecisionPoint.com, a premier technical analysis website specializing in stock market indicators, charting, and focused research reports. Mr. Swindlin is a member of the Market Technicians Association. Carl Swindlin, welcome to the program. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. Uh, how's the weather in uh, California? It's, uh, it's cold for us. It's like 48 degrees right now. 48 degrees. Right. Well, we're, we're snowed in up here in Seattle. I think it's in the teens. Very unusual weather. I think we can say thank you to La Nina for a cold, wet uh, winter this year. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. Um, Carl, you, you call yourself a self-taught technical analyst. How did you go about learning technical analysis, and, and what sparked your interest in TA? Well, after I retired from the Air Force, I, a friend of mine got me interested in the market, and uh, as it happened, there was a local uh, FM TV station, uh, Channel 28, KWHY, that uh, was broadcasting in the 70s and 80s, and they they did business news all day. And at the end of the day, there was, uh, uh, well, during the day they had uh, various uh, analysts coming on and many technicians. And then at the end of the day, they had a 30-minute program called Charting the Market with Gene Morgan. And uh, he was a broker from L.A. And he uh, did the standard uh, Edwards McGee stuff. And, uh, but in addition to that, he did, uh, the McClellan Oscillator and the vast decline line and some, and some broad market in type indicator. So I, I learned the basics kind of dozing off, uh, watching recordings of those daily <laughs> programs. <laughs> You know, you mentioned the name Gene Morgan in L.A. I, we we talked to uh, Tom McClellan about a year ago, and he told us, I, I'm pretty sure it was Gene Morgan was the name. Uh, this is how uh, his his parents uh, got started, was they, uh, Morgan had put out some kind of uh, request for ideas on television, and, and Sherman had responded with his McClellan Oscillator. Uh, it's interesting to hear you mention him. Yeah, um, that's, that's, that is true, and uh, uh, it, it's... Uh, that's where they got started, and that's how the oscillator became such a widespread uh, indicator. Yeah, uh, maybe we should get Gene Morgan as a guest. I wonder if he's still around. Uh, he is quite elderly, uh, as, um, as you know, the last time I've heard, and uh, I don't know if he'd be available for something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, okay, uh, you know, we, we've kind of gone right into a, a part of our podcast that we I, I usually save until a little later, but let's just go right there. You, you, you mentioned Gene Morgan's name. Uh, share with us some of, uh, who, who have been some of your other influences? Who, who have you uh, really, you know, whose work have you taken to heart? Um, quite a and few, do you have any really, favorite books? As I said, uh, the... The that local channel, which is no longer broadcasting uh, uh, business stuff, but it, you know, quite a number of people on that uh, who I listened to got ideas from. The late Kennedy Gavage was one uh, in particular. Richard Russell was another. Uh, because of that TV station, there's a large number of uh, technical analysts down here in Southern California. 
a, a coven, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> a lot of people would say that. <laughs> but uh, I essentially uh, have read, uh, I, I've skimmed some books, but uh, essentially I, I did it the hard way. I, I reinvented the wheel in many cases. And, Is that uh, right? And, and just learned from experience. At, at the time I was that I was learning, there wasn't a lot of publications available. Uh -huh. And uh, you kind of, you know, there were just not, you know, the very few. Now, you know, everybody in the business is writing a book. And uh -huh. uh, uh, so there's plenty of resources. But mainly I just did the analysis myself. I, I just just tried to figure it out uh, from my point of view. So it's yeah. I have a unique um, background in that regard. Well, you, you, obviously you do, and I think that uh, may show up in in your approach. You know, when I first look at looked at your your website, decisionpoint.com, I, I was a bit overwhelmed by everything that you have there. But as I started trying to digest some of, of it, uh, I started to suspect that maybe it reflects your own approach to technical analysis. Why, why don't you share with us what your approach is to technical analysis? Well, I uh, have evolved to the point where I work with mechanical models, and uh, our, uh, our basic model is the tr thrust trend model, and it and it uh, measures the. It, it's like well, bull markets begin with with large upthrusts. Usually, they're you know the bottoms are pointy. And uh, the tops of bull markets are rounded. So I uh -huh. designed a model that would would try to catch that early move, the thrust portion, and then it would evolve into trend following using uh, moving averages. And the moving average would uh -huh. eventually take us out at the top. So I, I've been working with that model for about five years. I, I, I tried to... I went into semi-retirement and stopped writing a newsletter about 2005 and uh, just let this model run and, uh, you know, wrote a few articles, but mainly that was it. I mean, that that was our approach. I didn't try to outguess the models, and, and it's done ex extremely well. I mean, it's not – we're not um, – in the top ten, uh, time, we're tracked by Timer Digest, and we're not in the top ten a lot. But we have a very, uh, really steady performance over the time that we've been using this model, and uh, and uh, it's uh, very satisfied with it. Yeah, so that's, well, that's go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just going to. You're taking me to another point in my notes here. I noticed that on uh, September seventeenth, two thousand seven, you were on the cover of Timer's Digest's uh, publication. What what was that about? Uh, Timer Digest uh, covers the people that. Uh, they, or, you know, they they do articles on the people that they're covering. They're about uh, they're over a little over a hundred people that they track, and they per periodically will get uh, a cover. Uh, one one year, uh, we lost well, year two thousand. I was a gold timer of the year, but oh. um, that's the kind of thing you'll get up there for if you if you're on any of their. Uh, rankings at the time, uh, then they'll they'll do an article on you. The coverage about every couple of years. Okay. All right. All right. You know, be before we leave uh, this whole discussion on uh, your, what's in your toolbox, so to speak, um, let me let me ask you something that might help some of our listeners. What, what do you find? That new traders do that professional traders avoid. You know, what, what can a person do that starting out in trading to get on the right track? Uh, that's hard. I, I wouldn't describe myself as a trader. I'm I'm a market analyst and a, you know do my personal investing. But uh, I I really think that the best system is to get a mechanical system that. That you run with discretionary decisions. Uh, let let the system make the mechanical decision, and then see if you think it's the if it's the right one. Uh, so you know, 
go to the charts. That's mm-hmm. really, and I think so many people, I don't know, there are a lot of traders out there that I hear, I, I understand that don't use technical analysis, but that's, that boggles my mind. It boggles your mind that people use technical analysis? That do not. Oh, do not! <laughs> Excuse right. me, traders, I got the yeah. wrong guest no. here. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to continue with Carl Swindlin in a moment, but first a reminder that on next week's program we'll have Larry Connors as our guest. Um, okay, Carl, you know you are a contributor to a, a, a newsletter that I receive regularly from StockCharts.com. Um, how did that relationship come to be, and, and is it more than just the newsletter? Can you give us some background? Yeah, I, I was uh, running my own website, at the leasing a server space. Uh, I can't even remember the name of the company. Actually, it was a number of companies. And generating my charts to an Excel program with macros, and mm. uh, it, was a, it was just a nightmare. Yeah, it sounds like Especially it. with the power of the computers back then, which is like no power. And uh, I happened to see ch- stock charts uh, uh, charts one day, and I thought, wow, these are nice looking. So I contacted Chip, who's the president, Chip Anderson, the president mm. of stock charts, and I said, hey, would you like to run my uh, server and do my charts, and that's where it started. So at the time, I contacted him. We were doing about 250 charts daily, and uh, now we have many thousands of charts that are generated daily on our mm-hmm. website. And uh, so they 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 completely, they're completely in charge of our server and, and the charting, which is a great relief to me. Oh, I'll bet. I'll bet. Okay. Um, you know, at your website, you have a, a proprietary indicator called Price Momentum Oscillator, or PMO. Tell us about this oscillator and, and how or why you developed and developed it, and, and what makes it different than other momentum indicators. Um, the exact formula is proprietary, and I to tell sure. you the truth, I probably I had to look it up to tell you what it was. <laughs> it's essentially. It's essentially a rate of change in the care, and, and uh, uh, it, it compares to the MACD indicator, except the MACD uh, is based <clears throat> not on, it's not on a ratio, on a, it's not on a percentage, but it's the, you know, the actual price differences. So over a long period of time, you, you get, uh, as, as say, a market, the market goes higher, you get uh, broader and broader swings on the MACD, whereas the PMO, you can look back over 20 years and you can still see uh, it stays within a range because of the ratio, and it's Mm. basically giving you, uh, uh, it's it's a way to look at, another way to look at rate of change, and I must say, uh, I spent a lot of my career uh, inventing Indicators, trying to invent indicators, and and I learned with the PMO that you know, there are other calculations out there that you'll get similar results. So, um, you know, you can take you, know, you can take a price index and crunch those numbers only so many times, and, and you start getting the similar. Uh huh. You know, so you're reinventing the wheel. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, yeah. This this one we use. Uh, one of the things we use it for is relative strength, and that we rank we ranked our stock list by relative strength. And uh, we also have chart books, and we do the same way. So the the highest strength stocks are at the top of the list and you know, the charts, and and it's an, an interesting way to look at a, a lot of charts. Yeah, you know what? What do you think? How many proprietary indicators have you developed? You got you got a rough idea, number wise? Oh, a handful. A handful. A okay. Handful, yeah, I. We were in Greg um, Mars's book on breadth indicators a number of times, and uh, but it's it's one of those things that I would recommend. Uh, Unless you have a really great idea, try to work with the stuff that's already out there because it's um, it, it just reinventing indicators 
is just uh, takes a lot of time, and uh, there's just some good stuff to work with. And I've yeah. gotten my approach down, so it's a lot simpler. And uh, yeah, well, you know, speaking of of what's already out there, it seems like sometimes uh, indicators usefulness will come and go. For example. Um, well, even at your site, you have a menu of Ritex funds. What do you think, Carl? Do, do Ritex funds work as contrarian indicators quite as well as they used to? And if not, why not? I don't. Um, I, I was a little worried about the Ritex um, funds. We, we track the cash flow and, and asset levels in Ritex. And I had. I was worried at that that uh, this monstrous increase in ETFs was going to drain a lot of money away from Ridex. And mm-hmm. that, I would say it's been minor at the, at the most, and uh, they've been holding their own. So what we're looking at is a, uh, a thin slice of the market that gives us some ideas on uh, sentiment. And uh, so I think, yes, they, they still work. Uh, what what other sentiment? What other sentiment indicators do you like? Um, we care. We have a lot of them. That we we want like investors intelligence, uh, uh-huh. the, uh, AAII. And, okay. And um, we have in a uh, national association of active investment managers, NAAIM sentiment, and that's that's an interesting one that. Uh, we just started carrying, and actually, I had some uh, input in, in having it developed. But oh, really? it basically takes these active managers, and they report every week what percentage they are, short or long, and uh, come come up with a, an average. So that that's an interesting one. That is interesting. Where would a person find that? Um, it's uh, it's under sentiment indicators on our main menu. Okay, <laughs> right. Okay, Carl, we're, we're, we're kind of getting to the end of our time here, and uh, I thought uh, before we go, I, I'd at least ask you uh, if you could share with us, has the MTA played any kind of role in your career? Uh, the MTA? Yeah, Market Technicians Association. Um, I can't say that it's it has uh, had a major influence uh I had connections with I have connections with people who are in the organization, obviously, uh-huh. but I don't. I, I honestly don't do a lot of outside reading, um, and uh, and that I, I've just basically developed my approach through my own observations and. Okay, and fair enough. Try to. Uh, I don't really dig a lot to see what what other people are thinking. Right. Well, you know what? Speaking of observations, um, today being uh, November twenty third, we've seen the S and P down twenty points at one point today, and the uh, the Dow. Well, the Dow's off one hundred and fifty right now. It was certainly down more than that earlier. What What are your thoughts on the market uh, for the weeks ahead? Um, I we're based on our models. We're in a bull market, and uh, I expect to see higher prices higher than the April high um, by the end of the year. By the end of the year? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. And right now, I think we're going through a small correction. Carl, it's been great having you with us today. Uh, Before we go, is there anything else you'd like to mention? Well, I I would like to offer listeners uh, a free trial to our website, decisionpoint.com, if they could just come to the website go to the help page and send us an email requesting a free trial, and, and we'll set them right up. Well, that's quite an offer. All right, then. Today's guest has been Carl Swindlin, and that wraps up this week's MTA podcast. From sunny Seattle, I'm Ed Carlson, together with our recording engineer, Shane Squark, in New York City. Say goodbye, Shane. Goodbye, everybody. Let's keep our stops tight. Good day.